Hey guys, what's up? It's Asa J from UnleashingLiberty.org and PoliceStateDaily.com. I wanted to make a quick video in reference to the most recent Resist the Tyranny Life chat in which there was some discussion about Lysander Spooner. Now I was in the the um, the text chat and couldn't really you know respond to an um, an American Mornings critique of of Spooner. So I wanted to make this video outlining a um, a defense for Spooner, um, an American warning claiming he he was a communist, and um, I'm gonna play the 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 segment. It's about a four or five minute segment in its entirety of, of his comments. To be fair, first, but let me let me say as well that as we were discussing some things in the chat, um, you know, we wasn't trying to force our preference onto anyone or to um, try to win over um, people who don't support Lysander Spooner. The question was, was Lysander Spooner a communist? And I will demonstrate in this video that he obviously was not. But um, here is that segment from the Resist the Tyranny chat, and you will have my response afterwards. So we've got eight minutes left, and... Uh... David, any rants you'd like to go on? I mean, I've been seeing your, your comments <laughs> out in the chat room. I just, I didn't know if you had like four minutes you wanted to fill. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I appreciate it. It's just, you know, people trying to dissect the difference between a, a communist and a socialist and sticking up for people that they shouldn't be sticking up for while in a chat talking about constitutionalism while embracing a person who badmouthed the Constitution. No, badmouthing the Constitution doesn't make somebody a communist. Signing themselves up for a communist organization is what makes them a communist. And so when you look at this, the grand scheme of what a person is, what they stand for, and what they represent, yes, there's the one element that Spooner tried to come out and say he was this or that or the other, and that's fine. But then there were his actions which showed that he was something very different. He was also a very confused individual, and if you do research on this individual, you'll see that, yeah, he said some pretty interesting things and some things I actually agree with. But he said a lot of things that I disagree with and a lot of things that were very confused and very much in line with, say, somebody like, um, um, I would say, in, in some regards, um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, for them. I mean, really, if you were to look at it and break it down into actual action, then that's what you're looking for. Now, if that's something you support and that's something you embrace, then fine, that's your right to do so. But to sit here and try to talk me into to, to even uh, following an ideology that is so utterly and ridiculously confused and based out of something that was contorted to begin with, no. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And, and it's funny to me because, once again, and just for clarification for those who are curious, um, once again, socialism is the theory of community of property, and communism is the doctrine of community of property. In fact, it says in communist manifestos and this and that and the other that there's a transition. Socialism is the transition of the elimination of the capitalist free market people into a system of pure communism. So, so once again, it's, it's about context, and I don't expect everybody to have it, and it's almost not even worth debating because there's years worth of research and ideas and context that go into that, and I don't expect everybody to have it. Therefore, people will literally latch on to the idealistic and, and utopian ideas of, of a movement that they don't fully understand or the complexities of, of, of the contortions that happened uh, uh, as a result. You know what I mean? And so, so, so no, I don't agree with somebody and I'm not going to follow with uh, somebody who, who badmouths the Constitution and I'm not going to subscribe to, 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 to the overall ideas of something that generally frowns upon constitutional values. There's a reason why the Constitution was written. Is it being followed now? No. Was it ever fully followed to its fullest extent? No. But that's not the point. It's the thing to strive for. It's the thing to shoot for, right? So it's what we should be. And ultimately, it, it, it enumerates unalienable rights, which cannot be licensed or shouldn't be, uh, but in theory, not allowed to be licensed, adjusted, altered, traded, or taken away. And, and, and that's the part that's missed on everybody. Why would anybody badmouth, badmouth such a thing? Because it can't stick up for itself and wage war on its own behalf? Or because it actually does demonstrate the fact that it's the individual that's responsible for the for the for the protection of it, but because of apathy, ignorance, and and 
utter laziness, no one's willing to do it, yeah, okay, fine, I can, I, can, I can understand that point, because then obviously the responsibility is on the person who, you know, ultimately just says, well, there has to be an easier way. Well, sometimes, you know, freedom and, and protection of certain rights isn't easy. Uh, they say that, uh, you know, uh, some of the things, some of the best things in life don't come easy. Well, that, that I would say an unalienable right is probably the best thing in life, and no, it doesn't come easy, and it needs to be protected, and freedom isn't free. And, and you know, it's, it's not a hard topic, and it's funny. So, I mean, while this turned into a rant, and, and it probably shouldn't be, um, you know, ultimately what we're talking about here is... Uh, um, you know, a clarification of value and and where you're from uh, in in the spirit of where you're at. And unfortunately, when we when we look at the grand scheme of things, a lot of people just don't know yet where they are in the grand scheme of anything, be it political or or fundamental ideas. Therefore, they're not in a position to even fight for the things that they believe in because they're unsure because they were ignorant of those ideas. So. I would challenge anybody who thinks that they believe in something to understand the full nature of what you believe. And, and, and not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff as well. It's like being a constitutionalist. We recognize that there are certain quote-unquote flaws in the grand scheme of having things like a government. But you also have to understand what makes that sacrifice for this or that or the other bearable. You know, if you look at Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine said the things that he said because they make sense. They're real. They are legit. Why do you think we use things like Thomas Paine or, or what have you? I mean, it's, once again, not to go down roads we don't need to go down. The point is, is just understand the pros and cons and the, and the good and the bad of everything. Don't just, don't just lash on to the idealistic. Sorry. That was a perfect four minutes. And now for my response. The assertion that Lysander Spooner, one of the staunchest supporters of individual liberty over the last 150 years, was a communist, is at best intellectually lazy, and at worst intellectually dishonest. Socialism is defined as a system of collective or state ownership over the means of economic production. Communism is a global socio-economic system prophesied to come after a world socialist revolution, void of private property rights and characterized by the absence of social classes, money, and the state, which supporters claim will wither away after attaining global hegemony. Lysander Spooner was an individualist anarchist, political philosopher, constitutional scholar, lawyer, and entrepreneur. He was not a communist. In fact, he was the exact opposite. Spooner was a fierce and avid supporter of private property rights, free markets, and individual liberty, and demonstrated this by his behavior consistently throughout his life. Spooner advocated natural law and recognized that acts of initiatory force or coercion against individuals and their property are immoral and illegal, but that so-called criminal acts violating government laws involving no traditional victim are illegitimate. He opposed all licensing requirements for lawyers, doctors, or anyone else that was prevented from being employed by such mandates. To prevent a person from doing business with another without a government license, Spooner saw as a violation of the natural right to contract with one's own property. Again, the exact opposite of a socialist or communist. Being an advocate of entrepreneurship, business, and self-employment, and opponent of government regulation, Spooner started his own business called the American Letter Mail Company, which competed with the socialized United States postal monopoly in 1844. An American Warnings argument fails on the basis of Spooner's radical support for private property, free markets, and entrepreneurship alone but his claim rests primarily on reports that Spooner was a member of the Socialist First International. Obviously, this hardly makes him a communist, but Spooner did have an interest in the labor movement and sought to build coalitions with the radical left around certain issues. Spooner believed that it is beneficial if people are self-employed so that they could enjoy the full fruits of their labor rather than having them share them with an employer and routinely attempted to influence leftist labor movements to adopt his positions. 
Spooner believed that government restrictions on the issuance of private money made it inordinately difficult for individuals to obtain the capital on credit to start their own businesses, thereby putting them in a situation where they had to sell their labor to others at rates lower than what the laborers could otherwise produce themselves. Again, to suggest that this somehow makes Spooner a communist is at best intellectually lazy and at worst intellectually dishonest. In addition, an American Warnings comparison of Spooner to Woodrow Wilson, who signed the Federal Reserve Act and instituted countless new government regulations, is absolutely ridiculous. An American Warnings disdain for Spooner is primarily perpetuated by his constitutional religiosity, describing Spooner's argument in his seminal work no treason that a document cannot contractually bind those who were not even born during its ratification as bad-mouthing the Constitution. If making an intelligent and legitimate argument for the individual right of free association, something one might think a constitutionalist who supports secession would be in favor of, if that is bad-mouthing, then I really don't know what to say. This argument was actually also made by Thomas Jefferson, who many constitutionalists and I revered. Can one generation bind another and all others in secession forever? I think not. The Creator has made the earth for the living, not the dead, Jefferson said, adding that every constitution then and every law naturally expires, and if it be enforced any longer, it is an act of force and not of right. Also, contrary to popular belief, Spooner, as a constitutional scholar, routinely, util routinely utilized the document to support his positions. In defense of his American Letter Mail Company, he wrote a pamphlet called The Unconstitutionality of the Laws of Congress Prohibiting Private Mails. Although Spooner had found commercial success with his mail company, legal challenges by the government eventually exhausted his financial resources, and he was forced to shut down. Spooner was also an ardent abolitionist. His most famous work, a book titled The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, was published in 1845 and was first to provide a codified constitutional argument against slavery at a time in American history when the majority of abolitionists urged the, argued that the document supported the institution. Spooner also published subsequent pamphlets on jury nullification and other legal defenses for escaped slaves and offered his legal services often free of charge to fugitives. Furthermore, Spooner was a fierce defender of states' rights in the Tenth Amendment. He was a radical secessionist and supported the South's right to secede prior to the Civil War harshly condemning Lincoln and the North for waging the war on false pretenses in order to secure Northern financial interests by reconscripting the South into the Union. Spooner continued to write and publish extensively in the decades following Reconstruction, producing works such as Natural Law or the Science of Justice and Trial by Jury, in which he continued to defend the doctrine of jury nullification holding that in a free society, a jury not only has the authority to rule on the facts of the case, but also on the legitimacy of the law under consideration. Obviously, I have successfully demonstrated that Spooner was no communist. I cannot, however, say the same about constitutionalists and small government conservatives like an American warning. While it's not fair to call these people communists or outright socialists, they definitely support socialist policies and institutions. Remember, the traditional definition of socialism here refers to the collective or state ownership of the economic means of any particular line of production. Though I'm not familiar enough with an American warning's ideological orientation to make assumptions, it is fair to say that most constitutionalists support socialized national defense or national government militaries, socialized domestic protection and enforcement of law or government police, and socialized infrastructure or government roads. These are socialist institutions. So maybe before you try to besmirch the reputation of one of the greatest defenders of individual liberty, private property, free markets, and states' rights of our time, 
perhaps you will hold yourself to the same scrutiny and examine your own socialist positions. Your comments on Spooner prove you rarely, if ever, have actually read his work, examined his history or behavior, or even have the ability to conceive of what individual liberty actually is. You don't believe in liberty. You believe in your liberty that you wish to force onto everyone else with things like constitutions.